Buonasera a tutte e a tutti, che questo sia un evento europeo si vede già dal minutaggio delle aperture di tutti gli eventi, che non chiamerei puntualità tedesca ma piuttosto puntualità svizzera, proprio. Fa comunque molto piacere. Io mi presento, io sono Michael Braun, eh, sono giornalista corrispondente del quotidiano Taz dall'Italia, vivo dal 96 a Roma, inoltre politologo. Io farò una breve introduzione prima di dare la parola a Wolfgang Merkel e vorrei partire dal voto europeo di neanche una settimana fa. Leggendo dopo i commenti, su media di vari paesi c'era tutta una tendenza che ci raccontava la paura è passata non c'è stato il botto populista in Europa se guardiamo i gruppi adesso nell'Europarlamento sì e no i populisti sono aumentati ma sono aumentati de, di poco se guardiamo quelli hardcore cioè EFD, eh, EFDD, ENF, ECR, i conservatori, saranno aumentati di 10 seggi o poco di più. Prendono sì e no questi populisti di destra un 150 seggi nell'Europarlamento, quindi un 20% ad occhio e croce. Quindi di che dobbiamo avere paura? I socialisti sono scesi i popolari sono scesi, ma sono aumentati i liberali e i verdi. E le forze europeiste insieme tengono. Questa è la lettura tranquillizzante, rassicurante. Il terremoto non c'è stato. Arriva però un grande ma. Se guardiamo più da vicino per situazioni nazionali, e inizierei dall'est, vediamo che in Polonia PIS è ancora aumentata e marcia sul 48% vediamo che in Ungheria Fidesz di Orban è ancora aumentato passando già da un risultato sopra il 50% nel 2014 arrivando adesso al 52% e schiacciando le forze europeiste Vediamo la Germania. AfD è stata arginata alle elezioni nazionali dell'autunno del 17, arriva al 13%, adesso arriva all'11%. Buone notizie, potremmo dire. Però se disaggreghiamo il risultato tedesco, vediamo che nelle regioni, nei lender dell'est, questo partito spopola. Arriva al in tutta la ex DDR al 21%, arriva in Sassonia al 25% ed è il primo partito, in Turingia al 22,5%. Adesso io potrei fare un po' di ironia e dire anche questa è Europa dell'Est, ex blocco sovietico, quelli dell'Est votano così, non sono ancora arrivati in Europa, se voglio fare delle tour comode. Ma forse non è così. Se volgiamo lo sguardo all'Europa occidentale, notiamo che in tre dei quattro paesi più grandi dell'Unione Europea, il partito populista di destra è il partito numero uno. Abbiamo il Brexit Party al 30,5%, più abbiamo un altro 3,2% UKIP. Quindi lì siamo al 34 più o meno di voto populista duro. Abbiamo in Francia il Rassemblement National di Marine Le Pen che supera Macron. Vi ricordate le elezioni presidenziali in Francia? Anche lì ci dicevano la paura è passata, ha vinto Macron, la Le Pen è schiacciata, adesso vediamo la Le Pen non è affatto schiacciata, è sempre lì, con un 20 in 3 virgola. Poi l'Italia, la Lega al 34,3 più Fratelli d'Italia al 6,4, quindi arriviamo 
ad un buon 40% di quello che in Italia si chiamerebbe voto sovranista, voto populista di destra, record nell'Europa occidentale. Quindi forse non c'è da stare tanto tranquilli, poi dovremmo ragionare anche sul 17 per i 5 Stelle che non sono populisti di destra ma sono comunque anti-establishment e fortemente critici verso questa Unione Europea e saremmo al 68% in Italia, forse non c'è da stare tanto tranquilli in questa Europa. Se anche ne, nella somma di, di tutti i voti nazionali arriviamo a questa, questo spostamento non enorme abbiamo tante situazioni nazionali dove forse c'è da preoccuparsi al che siamo proprio all'argomento di cui parlerà Wolfgang Merkel titolo della conferenza è la sfida populista in Germania e in Europa minaccia o correttivo punto interrogativo permettetemi due parole su Wolfgang Merkel lui professore di scienze politiche dal 2004 dirige il dipartimento democrazia e democratizzazione del Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin für Sozialforschung lo traduco in inglese almeno che è il Berlin Social Science Center uno degli istituti più rinomati non solo in Germania ma potrei dire in Europa e nel mondo di ricerca nel campo delle scienze sociali ed è inoltre professore all'Università di Humboldt di Berlino sempre di scienze politiche ed è uno dei massimi esperti della democrazia e della crisi della democrazia possiamo dire che Abbiamo vissuto, stiamo vivendo in questo periodo. Prego, Wolfgang. Buonasera, signore e signori. Grazie, Michael, per tua gentile introduzione. Uh, io cambierò la idioma e parlerò in inglese. Scusate per questo. I want to make a short comment what Michael already has presented on the European election. At least two comments. The first one is the European Parliament is not the most important arena of decision making within the European Union and the right-wing populists will not play a much bigger role than they have played before. The real power still lays with the Council and here the right-wing populists have much more power because the most important decisions there needs unanimity vote, needs uh, the Yes, the agreement of all governments in the Council. And here you have Hungary, you have Poland, you have the Czech Republic, and maybe in the near future you may have also Italy playing a crucial uh, role as a veto player. So the proper power and uh, even the proper field of uh, expression of the interests of the right-wing populist will be uh, the Council. I will immediately jump start in to uh, my presentation and here you see the cognitive map which leads me and therefore leads also you through my talk. I will briefly talk about the electoral development of right-wing populism and give you some very basic statistics. And then I will define uh, populism and right-wing populism somehow different from what has done yesterday in this excellent talk, Cas Mode. I will un try to understand populism as a kind of political strategy. And you will see this has some neo-Kramschian uh, background of it, and I think 
uh, we may understand uh, right-wing populism and the dynamics somehow better. I will distinguish between left-wing populism and right-wing populism. Left-wing populism is quite a different animal, and we should maybe stop talking only about populism. We should need, we should use uh, adjectives like left or right or authoritarian populism. And then I try to explain why do I think that right-wing populism is not simply a flash movement. It's not simply a flash party which emerges and then it uh, goes away. I'm pretty convinced that right-wing populism will be a major factor in the political competition within the European countries. So I will give you an explanation why I do think this way. And then, is it indeed true that right-wing populism is simply a danger for democracy? Does it uh, entail in specific or under specific conditions also uh, the power to be a corrective what goes wrong in our representative uh, governments and democracy. And then at the end I will reflect a bit what anti-populism can mean. Do we know how we confront uh, right-wing populism or are we simply the observer or the victims of this new political actors? So here you see uh, the electoral e evolution of all right-wing populist parties within here the blue line in Western Europe and here the upper red line in Eastern Europe. It is, uh, there is a strong increase of right-wing populist votes, but it is not so dramatic in absolute figures. So it is about 18, however, which party you call right-wing populist. There is a certain discussion about these type of parties. But uh, except some specific countries, they are not the dominant actors. They are going to be maybe the dominant actors here in Italy. Who votes for them? Or who votes for these parties? If we are looking to the parameter of education, then you will see that uh, the well-educated, here you see these are the high educated people, normally they have a university degree. And those people in the orange uh, columns, they have a kind of high school education and you here you have people with an elementary education. And what we can see clearly in all these countries that those people with a university degree are, with the exception of uh, Romania and Slovakia, are crossly underrepresented. So, well, people with a formal uh, high education do not normally do not vote for uh, right-wing populist parties. It is something different if you look to the lowest degree of education. It is uh, sometimes they are overrepresented, as in the Czech Republic, in Poland, or in Switzerland, but in the average they are more or less equally uh, represented. The strong cohorts, the strong social strata you find among the middle education, uh, the people with the middle education, as you can see here in the orange columns. If I would show you then a um, structure of the income, the household income, you will have more or less the same uh, picture. 
the households with uh, high incomes, higher incomes, they normally are, again, crossly underrepresented among the voters for right-wing populist parties. And it's, again, the lower middle strata who are overrepresented. Is there a link? Is there a relation between those who are or the political parties we subsume under right-wing populism, this is this line, and the decline of social democratic party. And here you can see that both graphs are narrowing. And to put it somehow simply, the working class parties are no longer social democratic or socialist parties in Europe, are clearly right-wing populist parties. Blue collar workers tend to vote for right wing populist parties, and this is one, only one of the problems social democratic parties are confronted with in Europe at present. So you have the typical voter for right wing populism, it is male. Think about uh, there is a significant overrepresentation of male voters. So think about that women, after the discrimination in the 20th century, now uh, have a majority and they decide we will suspend the suffrage for male voters. So men are not allowed to vote for 10 years. You may solve the right-wing populist problem. And as you, this is a quite an opportunistic remark, I know, uh, but uh, this is certainly not a realistic strategy to cope with the problem of right-wing populist parties. So they are male, they are coming normally from rural and small towns, they have a lower and medium income, and a medium and lower education. And the classical anti-right-wing populist voter is female, high income, well-educated, and coming from urban areas, from uh, big cities. So uh, what we have seen, this is quite important, and this is bad news for social democratic parties as well, is that uh, most of the right-wing populist parties, not all of them, but most of them, are going to move from a neoliberal start in economic and social policy now to a kind of social protectionism. Certainly with some chauvinist traits, but they are clearly moving to the left side. And this is, uh, they pay tribute to their electorates, and this is the reason why they are moving in this direction. And this is again back, uh, bad news for social democratic parties. And they are still, most of them are not realizing this new danger uh, for their political future. We heard yesterday, or some of you, and certainly me, I heard uh, from Kas Mutte that uh, right-wing populism is a so-called thin-centered ideology, meaning there is a certain political style, we uh, below uh, against those above. There is an anti-pluralist uh, component. They are anti-liberal and they are considering uh, politics as a zero-sum game. There are only winners and losers, and they have a certain distinct for compromises. Uh, and therefore, they are seeking hosts, like the socialist ideology on the one side, these are the left-wing populists, and the right-wing populists are embarking on nationalism, <laughs> Uh, anti-feminism and uh, chauvinism. But we can understand also right-wing populism as a discursive strategy. And this is something what the intellectuals and the few theoreticians of uh, right-wing populisms are propagating. It's a kind of 
uh, Gramscian strategy. You have to conquer the cultural hegemony. You have to dominate the public discourses. You have to impact on the political agenda. And if you are doing it, then you may uh, uh, have the chance to take over, not only the government, but the way of doing politics. And this is certainly something we can observe, and there is a discussion among these uh, theoreticians and uh, uh, intellectuals of these right-wing populist parties. The difference between left and right wing populist party if you uh, cons if you look at them through this lenses of discourses how they understand or i would say how they construct the people the people and the nation is constructed to a large extent this is not simply a natural entity and the difference between the left and right-wing populists is the following one. The right-wing populists are constructing the people on ethnic grounds, uh, so to say, on a jus sanguinis. Uh, the idea that the society or the people have to be rather homogeneous in cultural and ethnic terms. The left-wing populists are talking about the people as well, but they are constructing them as those who are the underprivileged in th society, the have-nots. And they have to be constructed as a political subject so they can act. Uh, and this is something completely different from the de definition of the people of, of the people by the right wing populists because this is exclusionary they exclude those people who do not ethnically belong or they tend to exclude uh, to the nation state people and the left wing a populism, at least in theory, tries to include, not to exclude, to include the socially marginalized uh, people into the political arena in order to create the chance having, the, having more or less equal life chances as Amartya Sen would uh, formulate it. So, Right-wing populism and to some extent left-wing populism are trying to overcome what we have seen from the 1980s onwards, a certain kind of post-politics. So politics uh, has to be, again, central in political discourses. How can we explain the success and the endurance of right-wing populism. And I offer you one explanation. This is certainly not the only one, but it's one explanation which makes more transparent what is going on on the sociological and the political level. And the main argument is there is a, no cle a new cleavage, a new divide of uh, European societies, and I call this new cleavage uh, a divide between cosmopolitans and communitarians. Who are these cosmopolitans? and who are the communitarians. So this is a kind of simple uh, graph which explains the logic of political and electoral competition in Europe. You have here the old distributional cleavage between left and right. So here you can think about these are the workers and here is capital. So this cleavage dominated to a large extent the political competition of the 20th century. And it is still working. But now you have an even uh, an cleavage which becomes more and more crucial and prominent. I call this cleavage a cultural cleavage which cross cuts 
the horizontal axis, the divide between capital and labor. These are, as the German sociologist Max Weber would put it, ideal types. They may not exist in reality as pure cosmopolitans and pure communitarians. And you can think on your own for a moment, where would uh, I place myself uh, within these or on these two axes? So you can have a cosmopolitan, and I explain in a second what I mean. You can have a cosmopolitan consciousness but you are still one of those strange people who believe there must be a redistribution of uh, goods and of income and of life chances, then you are a left cosmopolitan. And these are very often people part of the green movement and to some extent of leftist socialists or the few uh, left-wing uh, populists you still have in Europe. But if you think about that the nation state and the political community is still a valid entity and you think I have to relay, uh, rely on these uh, nation state and political communities, we should not give up them certainly only because we are uh, enthusiastic Europeans and you will see uh, there are reasons for that, then uh, you can be called a left communitarian. And here what I have called neoliberal cosmopolitans, these are those people, culturally progressive, but they do not want to redistribute anymore. And you find now more and more, and even among the Greens in Germany, people who think this way. And you will see one of the major feature of cosmopolitans is that they advocate open borders. Open borders in a very wide sense. Goods, capital for services, but especially for people, for the workforce, but also for refugees, for asylum seekers. The borders should be open. And the point of reference should not be the nation state, should be a cosmopolitan community. Meaning there should be a cosmopolitan, a kind of cosmopolitan citizenship. Again, these are ideal type construction. And if you had, at least in the past, people who are on the right, uh, in terms of economic policy, I told you this is now changing and they are insisting on the value of the nation state, you can call these people nationalist communitarians or uh, right-wing populists, uh, but you have people, as I have said, in this left uh, uh, quadrant where you can think about that the nation state is an important entity for policy making. And if you are a member of the lower classes, the lower strata, then you need a strong welfare state. And the problematic thing of a welfare state is you can construct a welfare state only within certain borders. On the supranational level, you will not create a strong welfare state. And this is one of the dilemmata uh, cosmopolitans may have. They propagating um, uh, a world with out borders or with not very strictly controlled borders. Uh, but at the same time, they have a sense for social justice. And the European Union, uh, to be a bit critical, and I am a convinced Europeanist uh, or European, but the European Union was completely unable to construct a second column next to the column of economic competition. And if you wanted to have it somehow simply, the European Union was a neoliberal machine for removing all the borders for capital and the exchange of goods and services. 
This does not mean that we should return to the nation state, but we should be honest, we should be critical. If we are not critical to the deficits of the European Union, we cannot really honor the positive sides and we are losing credibility, and we are losing credibility. So again, who are these uh, strange animals, the cosmopolitans and the communitarians? They are, again, they are the winners of globalization. They are among the political, cultural, administrative, and economic elites. And we did surveys among the elites uh, across five countries, including the United States. The elites are normally to, to the highest uh, imaginable uh, extension, they are cosmopolitans. Only those who, are, who have to be elected are somewhat more accepting that the nation state is uh, important, but also those people, the members of parliament, are uh, cosmopolitans. They are among the educated urban middle classes, and as I have said and argued to you, they are for open borders. This is more or less the core which defines cosmopolitan. They are prepared to transfer sovereignty rights to the European community. The basic argument is we have transnational problems, climate change, which we cannot work or we cannot fight on a national level. This is completely correct. Therefore, we have to give up sovereignty rights to the European Union. Again, the dil dilemmatic problem here is the moment where a nation state gives up competences to the European Union. He gives up rights into a political space which is less democratic than the nation state, at least if we are looking to Western Europe. And we have to be honest. We have to say, we have to accept uh, that it is not so easy to democratize such a supranational European space. But we could argue we may be prepared to give up some of the participatory democratic rights. But uh, because we are hoping that the supranational community is better in solving specific problems. This is not an easy trade-off, but we have to discuss it. And we should not go over it, simply say, we have to give up these competences. If you are a radical Democrat, you, you must be cautious, at least. So uh, they are in favor of deepening of the uh, European Union. They are the advocates of multiculturalism and Craig Calhoun, uh, former uh, president of the London School of Economics has called them the frequent flyers of our society. And here you have the communitarians. Again, the communitarians are not simply right-wing populists. There are two different versions, as you can see, of them. You have, they are normally among, more among the losers of globalization. You find them more uh, among low educated people. They want to have a strong nation state. And one reason is the welfare state, not the only one. They are more critical against deepening and widening the European Union. They want to have a strict control of the borders. And in German, uh, in German language, they speak about a light culture, meaning there is a main guiding culture which goes beyond uh, the constitution and addresses also habits, customs, historical symbols of a society. And they have this somehow, somehow anachronistic dream that we can go back to homogeneous, culturally, ethnically homogeneous society. And here comes the point. We have two versions of it. 
It was to some extent, and these are the Volkshemmet, the people who are in favor of the people's home. This is a Swedish word. The Swedish word from the Valhalla of uh, social democracy, meaning that uh, the people's home is a highly solidaristic uh, political and social community. There's a high degree of redistribution beyond the market. There is a trend and the tendency and the aim that there should be a uh, just society and the just again, the just redistribution of life chances. If you want to find a country now, and this is a term from the 19, late 1930s, if you want to find a country who fulfills this more or less, this is Denmark. Denmark is rigidly controlling the borders uh, in front of immigrants, refugees, and people coming in very rigidly. And if you read, uh, even from left parties sometimes, at least from the social democratic uh, parties, the program concerning the issue of immigration, it reads sometimes as a program of the German AFD, of right-wing populist party. Though these are different national contexts we have to take uh, into account. But the point is, Denmark is still, uh, during the last 10, 15 years, always among the best three or five uh, democracies on the globe, by far. And uh, uh, regardless which measurement you use, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Canada, are those countries always at the top, top of the best democracies. And if, if you look to equality, to the egalitarian issue, Denmark is much better than most or all countries of the European continent. But you have, a, so to say, normatively dirty, nasty version of communitarianism, and this is a right-wing populism, and they uh, may not insist that much on the nation state because of the welfare state, but very much on, as I have explained, on ethnic ground. This is a chauvinist, nationalist, uh, ethnical understanding what the nation and the nation state is supposed to be. What has changed uh, with democracy? Uh, Michael said at the beginning, uh, I am somebody who knows something about a specialist on the crisis of democracy, but I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm a specialist, but I'm cautious to use the term crisis. It is used for so many different things. And I started at the university in the 1970s, and we were already talking about the crisis of late capitalism, of uh, democracy, and we did not really stop talking about the crisis. But if a crisis is a permanent uh, uh, situation, then the whole term becomes semantically completely paradox or at least meaningless. So I'm not talking about a crisis of democracy, and if I would do it, then I would say our democracies are in many respects better than they have been in the past, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Think about the role of the women. Think about the role and the rights and the non-rights of homosexuals. Think about the rights of minorities. A tremendous difference today. Nevertheless, these democracies have become very fragile. There are major attacks and there are unresolved problems which undermine the stabilities of democracy. And I do not run through the whole uh, picture here. This is supposed to be a concept of democracy where you have a core. I call these partial regimes of democracy, these are elections. And in order to make democratic election democratically meaningful, I argue, they have to be embedded into guaranteed political rights, but also guaranteed political opportunities to participate. 
You, they have to be civil, there must be civil rights. Without civil rights and guaranteed civil rights, you cannot really freely participate. And there must be a check and balance, a control of those who are in power. And here, the, f the fifth uh, partial regime, those who we are electing, those who are in power, should be really govern us. So the criticism here is we may elect them, but they don't govern. They only govern themselves. They cannot control, they cannot steer, they cannot guide the economy. They are uh, powerless in front of Google, Facebook, and other multi-digital, multinational players, or deregulated financial markets. So here uh, we have certainly an unresolved problem after three or four decades of deregulation and globalization of our societies and markets. And what I want to say uh, is simply the changes democracy is undergoing or the unresolved problems you see in the, re in the uh, red letters. What we have here is a growing socio, uh, social selectivity. The thumb rule is the lower the electoral participation, the higher is the social selectivity. Social selectivity means those with lower incomes, with lower education, do not participate anymore, even not in the most easiest form of political participation. To They even don't vote. We, one could argue we are rather, most of the European, West European countries, rather stable two-third democracy. One-third does not take place. It diminished from the political scene. So a high social selectivity. But, and this is also an ambiguous effect of right-wing populism, what we have seen during the last five years is an increase in electoral participation across most of the countries in Europe, meaning uh, it is the polarization driven by right-wing populists of our discourses and political competition which brought people in, back into the political arena. And with each percentage higher political, uh, higher electoral participation, the uh, social selectivity diminish. What we have here is, here I argued, polarization can have a positive effect because we are discussing again crucial political questions, big political questions. The era of post politics is, going, uh, is coming to, to an end. So uh, on the other side, we have discourses where we we hear terms, we hear words which we not have dared to say or we would not have heard 20 years ago. And these are words uh, with a racist subtext, with xenophobic uh, contents, and these are certainly the very negative uh, aspects of the increasing polarization of our societies and discourses. What we have especially already going on in Eastern Europe is um, dismantling of certain civil rights. There is an illiberal trend and uh, Viktor Orban, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, and semi-authoritarian leader already propagates that the future of democracy is not these weak liberal democracies are the stronger illiberal democracies where the majority, 50.1% if it is necessary, decides what is going on. The winner takes it all. By the way, if you read these speeches of Viktor Orban, you feel remembered at Singapore already in the 1980s. There was a discussion among the legendary uh, uh, 
Governor Lee Kuan Yew. And Lee Kuan Yew was already propagating this kind of illiberal uh, democracy. And if there is an alternative to liberal democracies, especially in Asia, then it is Singapore. Uh, they understand democracy simply as majoritarianism, meaning what I have said, 50.1% is sufficient. They exclude the opposition, and they are not exclusive. They are not sensitive uh, to uh, minorities. And here you have a trend to renationalization, uh, which is a response, if you want or if you don't want, to some extent a response to the specific kind of neoliberal globalization we have seen during the last two or three decades. One word on a comparison. This is certainly something uh, not unproblematic, but I was thinking about Italy and Germany. What is the difference in right-wing populism? Why is right-wing populism in Italy stronger than in Germany? And here you see some factors and arguments. Italy has a weak state in many respects. And Germany has the tradition of a rather strong state. We can discuss later on why this is a major difference if it comes to the success of right-wing populists. Italy uh, has, from the beginning, from 48 onwards, uh, unstable governments. Germany has ha had, uh, most of the time, rather stable uh, governments. Right-wing populism is now uh, with the Lega in government. Right-wing populism is still ostracized from the political discourse, in, from the official discourse in Germany. And no, no party would even dare to say, yes, we, in maybe in the future we will have a coalition with right-wing populists. There may be coalition, but there's still what I have here uh, put uh, the last point, historical legacy. There is still this uh, legacy of the Nazi barbarism in Germany, which is still strong. And uh, there was a consensus among, uh, the, uh, among the public that a right-wing populist party should never enter the government, should even not be invited at uh, television talks. And with the year 2015, the influx of refugees and asylum seekers, this has been broken to some extent. I do not want to say it was a mistake to let the people uh, go in, but this is certainly a consequence of it, that this strong post-war taboo is going to be eroded in Germany. You do not have such a, a strong uh, legacy in Italy. The Movimento Sociale Italiano, a neo-fascist party, uh, was in the 50s, 60s already here in Italy, whereas mostly uh, these kind of successor parties uh, were banned in Germany. There is um, certainly a difference uh, between the economic prosperity uh, in both countries. Uh, Italy was a no-growth country for the last two decades, and Germany was rather strong in these uh, 20 years. Is, to come to the end, is right-wing populism a threat to democracy? And I give you first a very lousy answer. And the lousy answer is, it depends. And it depends on what? If you, there is a big difference uh, whether populism is in opposition or in government. If it is in opposition, it may uh, give messages, deliver messages to the established party 
that they left a representational gap, that they should do something different, that there are people who do not feel represented by them, and uh, they at least have to recognize there is a democratic uh, problem. However, if they are in government, then they influence specific policies and mostly with an illiberal uh, character. And there is a difference if they are uh, the junior partner, as it is the case in, or has been the case in Austria, and still is the case in Italy, at least in nominal terms, or if they are the dominant actor in government, as in Poland, and as it is the case in Hungary. And there's also a difference between rather stable democracies in Western Europe and less stable and less consolidated uh, democracies in Eastern Europe. And this explains to some extent why right-wing populists are so powerful uh, among the East European uh, countries. Functionally, I would say, is it a threat or not? Or let me a, a brief word. This goes quite easily, I would say. Normatively, it is a big problem. They are exclusionary. They do not uh, accept minorities with the same right, and uh, so on. And they frame political discourse in ethnic terms, which create nationalism and exclusionary uh, tendencies. Socioeconomically, uh, it is something uh, open to discussion whether this is a rebellion of losers, and they, uh, they send the message to those who are governing that there should be uh, changes. If it comes to the functional uh, impact on democracy, they may have positive, they may have positive, uh, effects as well. They are mobilizing the society. Great topics are, grand topics are discussed. And this is why left-wing populists like uh, Ernesto Laglau and Chantal Mouf are very much in favor of a populist style because they argue only these populist mobilization, in brackets a left populist mobilization, may challenge the rule uh, of the elites of our uh, society. And they bring, to some extent, the lower classes uh, back in. But to play with words, they are, to some extent, responsive, these right-wing populists, to the demand of those who do not feel represented, but they are uh, without responsibility for the whole, for democracy as a whole. So you have an enhanced responsiveness, but without uh, responsibility. So what to do? What to do against uh, right-wing populist parties with all in all are a major challenge to liberal democracy. And we have to confess, empirically, we do not know very much. We have anecdotic, uh, anecdotal evidence in Italy that obviously the coalition strengthen uh, uh, the Lega, and uh, we have it in other Scandinavian countries where right-wing populists were quite often in uh, governments, formally or informally. Uh, but uh, there is no systematic analysis so far. The uh, different instruments could be to ignore. This is what happened in Germany at the beginning, just to pretend these political force does not exist. They were not really invited to public talks, and the media did not really report about them, but uh, this was no longer uh, possible to fight them with normative arguments, cos what cosmopolitans do. The problem is always that very often the fight is not against populism, it is against populists or populist voters. And very soon, and this is not only true for the academic sphere, very often the cosmopolitans 
are insisting the truth is on their side. It's not only the right-wing populists who are claiming we know what is true for our society, uh, but this is also the case for uh, cosmopolitans with a certain hubris and a certain distempt, uh, contempt of the lower classes in their uh, countries. So uh, we have to be cautious how we conduct these uh, debates. Should we exclude them? I would argue at least we should not coalize, or the established party should not coalize with them. So I consider it as a mistake uh, what Partito Democratico did after the election that they did not explore more intensively whether there could be a coalition uh, between them and Cinque Stelle. So Lega entered government. And the same is true uh, what the conservatives did in Austria. So uh, we have to be cautious in our debates. We should not be so arrogant. We should not be immediately with the accusation, you are xenophobic, uh, you are machist, uh, and, uh, machismo, following a uh, uh, kind of machismo and uh, you are xenophobic. The problem is certainly there must be a red line, and this is not something we can uh, answer in a general way. I leave it with that, and I thank you very much for the patience having listened to me. Thank you. Grazie Wolfgang per questa analisi ricchissima di spunti e fammelo dire spassionata ed appassionata allo stesso tempo, questo mi ha colpito. Adesso la parola a voi um, per domande, anche per brevissimi interventi. Vi chiederei però infatti due cose, per favore vi presentate e siate brevi e concisi. Due minuti massimo a testa. Prego. Ecco. Okay. Um, hi. That was a really great talk. I found it really interesting. Um, so you, you spoke about some of the demographics um, that are voting for these right-wing populist parties. Um, I was just wondering, you, you missed off age as a, as a demographic, and uh, I come from a country where that recently voted for what could be said to be a right-wing populist movement in Brexit, um, and that was overwhelmingly voted for by old people. Um, so how, <laughs> how, do you, how do you see age fitting into the right-wing populist? Okay. Actually, age is not something which distinguishes from uh, the normal structure, the age structure of the society. Uh, it's not the most youngest cohort uh, which votes for right-wing populists, uh, but uh, it is more or less uh, the people between 30 and 50 years, which are, on the average in Europe, the strongest uh, cohort uh, with uh, right-wing populist preferences. But if you have a country like Hungary, where you have 50% of the people voting for Fidesz, then you have more or less the structure of the age structure, the social structure of the society. And uh, sorry to say, there is a decline of catch-all parties all over Europe. And the only one uh, catch-all party really left is this authoritarian uh, and right-wing party, Fidesz. So it's a, a more precise difference if we go to countryside and urban areas, if we look at the educational level, if you look at the income level, but uh, the classical right-wing uh, voter is something in the middle and not the pensioners and not 
uh, the youngest cohorts. So you are coming from UK or where are you? Yeah. Okay. Ah, si. la parola. Okay. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Sonia. I was wondering about the uh, responsiveness versus responsibility point you uh, raised before. I was wondering, um, it might be something we still cannot know because there's no, uh, I mean, it's too much uh, far away in the future. We can't really have the answer, but if you could have any assumptions, that would be amazing. Um, can populist parties uh, govern for a long time and still be populists, or are they going to uh, fade away with their responsiveness, um, gaining responsibility, or I mean, do they have to transform, or can they stay populist and uh, have this respons responsiveness uh, still when they're in power? Thank you. Grazie. Very good question. Even uh, the responder should not qualify a uh, question is good or not so good. Uh, but um, this is a question we are thinking about the anti-populist strategy as well. And the reasoning was the following. As a protest party in opposition, you can come up with maximalist uh, demands. You can criticize uh, completely the establishment before you become uh, establishment on your own. Uh, normally, I would argue, uh, government has a pacifying effect on the radicalism of political parties because they are integrated in an international uh, structure of trade, of uh, treaties, and uh, so forth. And they have to at least uh, accept some rules of the market, for example. Uh, nevertheless, if we look to Eastern Europe, if, you look to, if we look to Poland and Hungary, we have parties uh, which are now for a longer time and a second or third time in governments which did not de-radicalize, which started to dismantle certain uh, liberal positions and structures uh, and, of course, newspapers in the case of Hungary. So they did not uh, follow a responsible policy but they were considered to be responsive to the uh, hardcore client clientele of right-wing populism. If you look to the strange, strange populist, uh, um, Donald Trump, so you uh, see he can say what he wants, where we very often think now this is his end. This is what we thought during his campaign. But his followers feel uh, that he is responsive to their claim, because here they found somebody who hears them, which the established parties did not. Nevertheless, the voters still are, uh, right-wing populist voters are not only uh, convinced xenophobics uh, and so forth, there is always an amount of protest votes. But this has disappeared in Eastern Europe, and I'm not sure, and or I'm more optimistic, it will not easily uh, uh, disappear in, West, in Western Europe as well. This is a difference between well-established democracies and less consolidated democracies in the East. And Italy will be in the next year one case we have to observe. We have to observe and whether there is a chance, and obviously if the dynamic keeps on, there is a chance that the Lega becomes the dominant actor in uh, government. Uh, and the Lega probably has to be less xenophobic because they are supported by the uh, by business in northern Italy, and uh, business is op for in favor of open borders. Uh, so there are limits to it, and so there is the hope if they really becomes 
the dominant actors, they have to look to these more cosmopolitan positions you find among business people. Grazie. Qualcun altro che chiede la parola? Io devo dire quello che ho trovato importantissimo nella conferenza era davvero la distinzione fra eh, i comunitaristi e i cosmopoliti eh, a seconda del, dell'approccio la si butta molto anche sull'economia quelli tagliati fuori le periferie verso le metropoli verissimo quello il discorso delle periferie se guardiamo anche il voto italiano dell'altra domenica il PD regge nei grandi centri in Campania diventa una eh, forza secondaria se non terziaria nei grandi centri resiste nei centri storici c'è chi chiama me l'ha detto uno attivo nel PD noi stiamo eh, diventando il partito ZTL mi diceva <ride> e c'è del vero se guardate il voto anche dell'anno scorso a Roma a Milano, a Torino, quali collegi hanno preso? A Roma ormai i famosi parioli, un tempo mai conquistati dalla sinistra, erano tre o quattro collegi, proprio centro storico e eh, quartieri attigui, dove abito io, oppure un quartiere di eh, classe media, media alta, soprattutto di classe media istruita, i famosi ceti medi riflessivi. Torino stessa immagine, Milano, andiamo nelle periferie, già delle metropoli, il PD perde miseramente, il PD sarebbe il partito se tralasciamo un attimo la Bonino, lei è il partito ideal tipico dei cosmopoliti liberisti potremmo dire il PD sta un po' sul centro e l'asse comunque spostato verso il cosmopolitismo quindi si ripete questo schema ma si ripete anche in Germania se guardate il voto dei Verdi che è forse il partito più decisamente anti-AFD come valori cioè cosmopolita enfaticamente europeista i Verdi ormai sono il primo partito in tutte le metropoli, in tutte le grandi città, a Berlino, a Monaco, ad Amburgo, a Colonia, potremmo continuare questo elenco, primo partito talvolta al 30% con un 20% di media nazionale. But Michael, uh, sì, prego. Michael. We have, uh, we have to take into account that we cannot easily extrapolate uh, uh, from the European elections. If they are national elections, the Greens will not be the strongest parties in, uh, party in most of these big cities. They will have strongholds, yeah. especially where you have strong university, uh, a strong university people, uh, population. So, uh, These are, to some extent, second-order election, and this was a peak and, uh, of, green, of the Greens in Germany and, to some extent, in, um, in Austria. But if you look to the other countries in Europe, the Greens uh, do not really uh, appear. You will have find some in the Netherlands, uh, in France, and maybe in Scandinavia and in Southern Europe. You don't have them. You, and in Eastern Europe, Greens uh, do not really exist. What is true that if you have this cleavage between these, those who are in favor of open borders and to close the borders, and especially if the Greens are, so to say, the monopolist interpreters of how to fight climate change. This was the a uh, decisive point at the end of the European elections in Germany that the Greens were the only one who could create some credibility that uh, they are in favor to fight uh, uh, climate change whatever it costs. And you have asked about the young uh, population. The young population was especially the one who was voting for the Greens. But according to my perception, 
Greens cannot become what Germans call the People Party or Catch-All Party. They are the party of the privileged. They are the party of the best educated in, in the German society. And they will not reach the lower uh, sectors of our societies. Here you see limits uh, uh, for the expansion of the Greens. Grazie. But I have a question. How did you call? I did not understand it in Italian. How did you come as chiamato il partito? ZTL, Zona and Traffico Limitato. Ah, now so I got it. it. <laughs> ecco, se non ci sono altre domande, ecco, eh, il signore qui. Eh, microfono, un secondo. Questa mattina, Prima lui, poi lei. questa mattina abbiamo partecipato ad un'altra conferenza dove si parlava di populismo ed è stata attribuita alla um, crisi economica del 2008, eh, diciamo così, l'inizio, la partenza di questa ondata populista, quindi la mancanza di certezza da parte della gente dal punto di vista economico ha scatenato questa cosa. Lei è d'accordo su questa, su questa diciamo così, posizione e soprattutto eh, può spiegarmi come mai in Italia eh, eh, l'ondata populista ha colpito, così identifico la persona, l'operaio del Sud, per capirci, che ha eh, diciamo così, votato per questo, per questo partito populista di destra. Ecco. Prendiamo ancora la domanda del signor Li. Sì, mi chiamo Ermanno, eh, molto sinteticamente. Papa Bergoglio è un cosmopolita. Chi? Chi? Papa Bergoglio. Papa Bergoglio, Papa Francesco, è un cosmopolita. Uh, so Papa. Eh, Papa, sì. Intanto è un oriundo, se vogliamo, non è neanche cittadino europeo. Probably the last question, I'm too ignorant uh, and uh, too agnostic uh, to, and not uh, empathetic uh, enough. And I don't think he, or I should be cautious. Uh, <laughs> where I'm more certain, if we take a country like Germany, if we take countries like Scandinavia, if we like, uh, like Eastern Europe, I don't think he will have any impact on the development of, uh, of right-wing populist party or of cosmopolitans. And, If I would have to place the Chiesa Cattolica in this cleavage line of communitarians and cosmopolitans, even it in some ex to some extent is a very cosmopolitan institution without uh, borders. Uh, and you, you find the believers, Catholic believers all over the world. On the other side, uh, I'm, I'm rather skeptical that he, uh, that the Pope will have a major impact on, on this kind of evolution. He has a bigger impact if it comes to the third world, if it comes to hunger in the world, if it comes to misery, and even social policies sometimes, that's what you find among bishops, Catholic bishops uh, in Germany uh, as well. And they, they have a communitarian, uh, in, in some way a communitarian uh, base uh, if it comes to certain values. They are not very much in favor of LBGTQ. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm even not sure uh, whether uh, I had even now uh, problems to spell it, uh, whether the Vaticano can really spell it. So uh, I'm I'm too ignorant, and this is not a good answer. I I should not even have tried it. Uh, <laughs> La crisi economica, uh, starting point, certainly not a starting point uh, uh, for right-wing populism and right-wing populist success. 
But what economic crisis creates, they create uncertainty. And uncertainty is a ground where populists of both sides can mobilize, can mobilize against those who are in power. Because those who are in power are the ones who were made responsible for the economic crisis and then the way they tried to solve the economic crisis. But if you look then to Europe, there's a complete different picture. Uh, if you look from the south, the recipient countries, or you look for, from the north, uh, the donor countries or the guaranteeing countries. Uh, so then you have a complete different point of view of the right-wing populists. Right-wing populists think in Germany on this matter, we should not give that much or guarantee uh, the money for uh, the uh, failing economic states in Southern Europe. Uh, but uh, this is completely different. If you are a populist party in the South, you have good arguments to uh, opt and to act against this introduced austerity policy from the North. So you see there are splits running through European uh, right-wing populists because they are nationalists and you have nationalist differences and different interests in the nation states and this gives hope that they will not form, so to say, a powerful acting unified uh, subject in the European Union. Chiudiamo con questa speranza. Ringrazio senz'altro Wolfgang Merkel. Ringrazio voi per il vostro interesse e ringrazio la cabina per il supporto cruciale. Grazie.